So what are perilunate injuries? For any condition for the exam, it's useful to have an introductory sentence. And what that introductory sentence does is it provides you with time to think about what the examiner is actually asking you. So the way to answer this question is to say that perilunate injuries are a dissociation of the lunate from the carpus. And that tells the examiner that you know what you're talking about and it gives you time to think about exactly what they're asking. Perilunate injuries are reasonably uncommon. They're invariably a high energy injury and they have a combination of ligamentous and bony components. And they are an example of a complex carpal instability. Now I'm not going to go too much into carpal instability this evening because that in itself is an hour's presentation. But I will touch on it a little bit to be able to explain perilunate injuries within that context. So why are perilunate injuries important? Well, the first reason is they come up in the exam. So that's why they're important. But they are injuries which can be potentially devastating to the hand and wrist, but can appear reasonably innocuously on a radiograph. So this is a PA radiograph of the wrist. The more eagle-eyed amongst you will have already spotted a diagnosis, but you can imagine that this is easily called normal by somebody either in a rush or who's inexperienced. And it's another lesson that in the exam, when you see a radiograph like this, ensure that you ask for the lateral. And here you can see that the, the lunate is perched on the edge of the radiocarpal joint. So the capitate is in purple and the lunate is in red. And you can see how these uh, bones overlap on both radiographs. Why are these important? Because 25% of these injuries are missed at presentation. So one in four of these potentially devastating injuries to the wrist are missed. Why is that important? Well, there's good evidence to show that if you delay reconstruction of these injuries, their outcome will worse. So how can you stop yourself missing these injuries, both in practice and for the exam? Well, Galula, who was a radiologist from America, provided us with Galula's lines. And these are three lines which are smooth and unbroken and continuous. And the first line is drawn along the proximal edge of the proximal carpal row. The second line is drawn along the distal edge of the proximal carpal row. And the third line is drawn along the proximal edge of the distal carpal row. And these three lines are Galula's lines. If you draw these out for you, say that you're looking for them in the exam, the examiners will know that you're being thorough. We have a normal PA radiograph of the wrist on the left, and you can see that Galula's lines are easily visible. On the right, we have the PA radiograph from the uh, perilunate dislocation, and if we draw in Galula's lines, you can see that they are not smooth and they are not uh, concentric. So how can we classify perilunate injuries? So in 1980, Mayfield described his classification of perilunate injuries. And originally Mayfield's classification was purely a soft tissue classification. This was an anatomical paper and he loaded cadaveric wrists and found that a predictable pattern of injury occurred when a hyperextended wrist was taken in initially on the deviation. And the diagram you can see, the straight lines are ligaments that are under tension and the jagged arrows are ligaments that are not under tension. So you can see the center of rotation is the X in the cabinet. And that forced on the deviation injures the soft tissues on the radial side of the wrist first. As that force progresses through the carpus, intercarpal supination occurs. And you can see that the pole with the X next to it is centered in the triquetrum. So this intercarpal supination is centered through the triquetrum and it is this movement which then injures the soft tissue on the ulnar side of the wrist. So if you remember that a soft tissue perilunate occurs 
with a hyperextended wrist which is ulnar deviated with intercarpal supination, you've advised the examiner that you're aware of not just the classification, but how the mechanism of the injury works. In the same year, Johnson divided these into lesser and greater arc injuries. And it's useful to be able to talk about this in the examination. It's easy to remember, lesser arc begins with an L and ligament begins with an L. So you know that the lesser arc injury is a soft tissue injury, and that's the red line in the picture. And the greater arc are ones which involve bony injuries, the blue line in the picture. And these have the terminology trans. So if you have a radial fracture and a scaphoid fracture, these are transradial trans scaphoid injuries. In order to think a little bit more about how these uh, injuries are um, achieved, you need to understand some ligamentous anatomy of the wrist. So the best way of dividing ligaments in the wrist is to divide them into intrinsic and extrinsic. So the intrinsic ligaments have an origin and an insertion within the same row. So the common intrinsic ligaments that everybody will have heard of are scapho lunate and the lunotriquetral ligaments. Uh, and those are the yellow lines on the image. We then can talk about the extrinsic ligaments and we can divide those into two. We can divide them into the palmar extrinsic ligaments. It's useful to think about the palmar extrinsic ligaments as being arranged a bit like a Citroen sign. Other cars are available, but the two parallel chevrons are useful to help contextualize the ligaments for the exam. So you have a distal row of the radioscapal capitate and the ulnar carpal ligament. And then you have a proximal chevron of the long and short radiolunate ligaments and the ulnar lunate ligament. And this is important because in between the two chevrons is an area of relative weakness. And this area is called the space of Poirier. And this is where the lunate dislocates through if you are able to achieve a Mayfield 4. And we'll talk more about this later. The dorsal extrinsic ligaments are also arranged like a chevron. So there is a proximal limb, which is the dorsal radiocarpal ligament, and there is a distal limb, which is the dorsal intercarpal ligament. The uh, clinical image is of a gentleman who is six weeks down the line from his perilunate injury, and you can see that under the gelpi is the ligament tissue that I've reflected off the back of the carpus. And this approach is called the Mayo or the Burgers approach. So it's useful to um, have these names in your repertoire. So let's go into a little bit more detail about the Mayfield classification. So stage one is a scaphalunate ligament injury. Stage two is a scaphalunate ligament injury with a mid-carpal ligament injury as well. Stage three has a scaphalunate with a mid-carpal with a lunotriquetral ligament injury as well. And this is your classic perilunate injury. This can be, um, you, can, you can see that the collinearity between the long axis of the capitate, which is in green, and the long axis of the radius, which is described by the purple line, that collinearity is no longer present. And then the final Mayfield stage, Mayfield 4, is when the radiolunate ligaments are injured. So going back to our case, this is the case that we could see. So we've got a Mayfield 4 injury. The lunate has dislocated out of the front of the carpus. But this is where knowledge of that um, extrinsic ligament is useful. So the only ligament holding that lunate where it's perched is the short radiolunate ligament. And it's, this is a really strong, really tough ligament, and it takes a huge amount of force to be able to rupture this. And this is why we often see these lunates perched on the edge of the radius. Let's touch on carpal instability briefly and explain why these are an example of a complex carpal instability. There are 
four main types of carpal instability. The one that I'm not going to talk about today is the adaptive carpal instability that you see after malunion of the distal radius commonly. So that leaves us with three more. The first type of carpal instability is that of carpal instability dissociative. And that is where you get an instability between bones in the same row, most commonly proximal carpal row. So this is an example of a scaphal lunate or a lunotriquetral ligament gives a carpal instability dissociative. The second type is a non-dissociative carpal instability. And this is where there is an instability between the two rows, the proximal row and the distal row. So the rows themselves are still well aligned and still stable, but there is instability between them. So now, if you combine a dissociative and a non-dissociative carpal instability, you end up with a complex carpal instability. The Mayfield uh, 2, 3 and 4 give you instability within a row and within the two rows. So that's why these are a bad injury. There's one other subtype to be aware of, and this happens rarely, and that's called scaphocapitate syndrome. And this is where you have a transscaphoid transcapitate fracture. And what can happen is, is that the proximal pole of the capitate can rotate, sometimes through 90 degrees, sometimes through 180 degrees. So if these injuries are not picked up and are treated as just scaphoid fractures, you can end up with significant mid-carpal degenerative change. And there's the image without the, um, without the purple line so that you can see it. So we've talked, about, uh, we've talked about the classification, we've talked about mechanisms of injury, but in the real world, how are we going to assess these injuries? We have to assess these patients holistically. We have to ensure that this is the only injury given that these are high energy problems. Now, in the context of the exam, I'm sure the examiners find it frustrating that candidates say, I would assess this patient via an ATLS protocol. I'd like to make sure that they've got a patent airway that I think in the exam, if a useful sentence to have is, I would obviously um, assess this patient via the ATLS protocol, but on the presumption that this is an isolated injury. And then you take, you've mentioned the fact that you will use ATLS, but you are not wasting time. So if there are other injuries, you need to resuscitate these patients appropriately and take an accurate history. You want to know the mechanism. You want to know whether um, this is an open or a closed injury. You want to know their hand dominance, whether they've got comorbidities, all of the usual things that you would assess for within a history. Examination of these injuries Often there is a lot of swelling which masks the deformity. It is exceedingly important that you thoroughly document the neurological status of the hand. Medium nerve compromise is common with these injuries and it needs to be documented and monitored. And then you get your radiographs. So what are you looking for on your radiographs? While well, you're looking for your Galula's lines, which probably won't look as good as this, and then there are two radiological signs that you can talk about in the exam. The first is this triangular piece of pie sign. And the second is what's called the spilled keep teacup sign. And this is where the lunate is perched on the edge of the radius. So we've assessed the patient and we now need to move on to management. And it's at this point that I think a lot of candidates find it difficult. So when you have something that's complicated, it's easy to, easier to break it down into manageable chunks. So when I think about the management of perilunate injuries, I think about their emergent management, and I think about their definitive management. So the emergency management of uh, perilunate injuries is pretty straightforward. You can treat it like any other dislocated joint. You want to reduce the joint, so you reduce the carpus. Now, how do you do that? Well, you can use finger traps so that you've got longitudinal traction and you can leave them up in the finger traps for a good 20, 30 minutes. And then you can 
try your um, manipulation and closed reduction. So how do you manipulate these? Well, these can be difficult to reduce closed. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to perch the capitate back into the concave surface of the lunate. Now on the right hand image, you'll see that the thumb is supporting the lunate. It's really important that you do that from the start of your manipulation. What you don't want to do is to convert a Mayfield 3 into a Mayfield 4 by pushing the lunate into the carpal tunnel whilst you're trying to manipulate. If you're not successful in manipulating in the emergency department and there's no ability to um, provide you with uh, some sedation to help um, reduce the muscular tone, then I would advise taking the patient to theatre. The key thing is, is that if there are any signs of median nerve compromise, you should decompress the median nerve. If you decompress the median nerve in the way that is drawn on the hand, you are not burning any bridges. This approach is not difficult in the context of trauma. You do your carpal tunnel decompression as normal, so you know you're in um, you're in routine, familiar anatomy. And as soon as you know where your median nerve is in the carpal tunnel, you can extend your incision proximally and you can release that forearm fascia so that you've, you've protected the median nerve into the distal third of the forearm. And at this point, when you've achieved a reduction and a, decom uh, and a decompressed median nerve, you can say to the examiner, and at this point, uh, I would request a CT scan to uh, exclude any bony injuries, and I would refer to my uh, local hand surgery service. Now, when you make this statement in the exam, don't stop. You know that the next statement that the examiner is going to make will be, OK, and what is your local hand surgeon going to do? So a way around this is to say, I would request a CT scan and I'd refer it onto my local hand surgery service. But their principles of management would be, and you can then go into talking about the definitive treatments further down the line without frustrating an examiner by making them ask a question that you know they're going to ask anyway. In the courses, it's at this point where I get lots of questions about what if this, what if that, I'm in a DGH in the middle of the night, what do I do? So I've distilled emergency management down to the six common endpoints. So if you've reduced it in the emergency department and there are no median nerve signs, observe the patient as an inpatient. So admit the patient, elevate uh, the hand and keep an eye on them. If they're reduced in the emergency department and they have persisting median nerve signs post-reduction, then I would advise and our unit's protocol is that they have a median nerve decompression expediently, i.e. that night. If they're not reduced in the emergency department, then they go to theatre for reduction. If you're in a theatre scenario and you've achieved a successful closed reduction in theatre, I would advocate decompressing the median nerve. You have either an anaesthetised patient or a patient with a peripheral blocking. What you don't want to happen is for you to then go into the recovery room and find that post-reduction they've got median nerve symptoms. So whilst they've got their anaesthetic on board, decompress their median nerve, you've made them safe so that their uh, definitive treatment can be planned appropriately. Say you can't achieve reduction and they've got a Mayfield 4, so the lunate sitting perched. This is straightforward. You're going to do a Palmer approach, exactly the um, incision that I've uh, shown. You're going to decompress the median nerve and that will take you down onto the front of the wrist and you can put the lunate back in. If you have an unsuccessful closed reduction and it's a Mayfield 3, so the capitate is dislocated dorsally, I would approach the homily to start with because I'm going to want to do a median nerve decompression. So I'd approach it palmally, decompress the median nerve, find the soft tissue injuries in the front of the carpus, remove any interposed soft tissues, and I can then directly control the lunate whilst I'm reducing the capitate into it. Now if I can't achieve a reduction through the front 
I can open the back and I can put a McDonald's in and I can uh, lever the capitate back in. But if I go through the front first, I may not need to do my dorsal approach. But if I do the dorsal approach and reduce it that way, I'm definitely going to want to decompress the median nerve. So emergency management, I think, can be distilled into those six outcomes. So let's move to definitive management. And if you remember these four things about definitive management, then you've covered all of your bases. So what do you want to achieve with your definitive management? You want to reduce the lunate in the carpus. You want to hold the lunate reduced. You want to reconstruct the injured structures around the lunate and protect the repairs until they heal. So if you state these are the principles of definitive management, you've explained to the examiner that you understand what you're trying to achieve. So Palmer approach. So um, I have to thank Ramon for uh, this image. It's a, it's a beautiful image. Um, this is the uh, approach that Ramon has done through the incision that's marked. You can see he's released the transverse carpal ligament and decompressed the median nerve. This is the common flat mat which is retracted radially. And this here is the interval between the common flexor mass and FCU and the neurovascular bundle. And what you can see here is this rent in the soft tissues. So that is the space barrier. The lunate had dislocated through that rent and he'd reduced it and then taken the photograph. So this approach can seem quite uh, intimidating, but if you do your median nerve, your carpal tunnel release first, and then extend proximally, you know where the median nerve is, you know that you're safe, and when these are fresh trauma, the interval between FCU and the common flexors is easy to find and is easy to develop. So the dorsal approach to the wrist, the landmarks are listus tubical and EPL. And I execute a longitudinal midline dorsal incision based on those landmarks. You will need to know the extensor compartments to the wrist. I use the interval between the third and fourth extensor compartment. I reflect the common extensors away and I exteriorize EPL so that I've got space. And at that point, you're looking at the back of the carpet. And it's at that point you do your Burgess flap or your Mayo flap, and you can then see the entirety of the back of the wrist. So this is the gentleman who is six weeks down the line. This is the proximal pole of his scaphoid, which is a lunate, tricretium, amate, capitate, and his TT joints up there. You can see the injury to the scaphoid lunate ligament. And what you can see is, is that I've put a wire in the distal pole of his scaphoid, and I've put a wire in his lunate. And this is the first phase of the reduction that you're trying to achieve for the lesser arc injuries. Citing these wires is quite important. This picture from um, the AO group, I think, is the best schematic representation I've found. You can see that the way that they've cited the wire in the lunate is parallel to this concavity. I try really hard to get that wire parallel to the concavity. Now, the reason for that is, is that it then provides me with a very good visual aid. If that wire is sticking up 90 degrees, to the long axis of the forearm, I know that my ligament is in a reasonable position without taking the radiograph. The image on the right, you can see how much I've bent those wires to achieve the reduction. You can now see that the scape lunate ligament is opposing where it needs to be on the lunate. And you can see that these wires have changed position. In the um, AO manual, you'll find them talking about clamping these, these bones to hold them together. You can do. Another neat trick is if you've got the wires in a position like this, you can then just bend these wires around themselves a bit like you would for a tension band, and that will help to maintain this reduction. So once you've achieved this temporary reduction, what do you do next? 
So what you're looking to achieve is a wire construct, a little bit like this. So when you've got your joysticks in the right place, you've got the bones reduced. The first wire I've put across is a scapho lunate wire, and that protects my scapho lunate ligament. I then put a triquetral lunate wire in. This protects the repair of my lunate triquetral ligament. And I then put a scapho capitate and a triquetral hamate wire in so that I've locked the mid carpal joint. So the distal carpal row can't force the proximal carpal row to move. And once I've got this construct in situ, I can then do my soft tissue reconstructions, be that suturing of mid substance tears or putting anchors into avulsions and um, suturing li ligaments back down to bone. For greater arc injuries, fix the bones first and work proximal to distal. So if you've got a transradial, trans scaphoid injury, fix the radius first, then the scaphoid. If you've got a trans scaphoid injury and the radius is fine, fix the scaphoid first before you put any stabilizing wires into the rest of the carpus. Trans scaphoid fractures tend to displace more and can be a little bit trickier to fix than in inverted commas, normal scaphoid injuries. So use the instability in the carpus to enable you to see the scaphoid better and to be able to achieve a better reduction. Here you'll see that I've put two micro trap screws into the scaphoid because the first one didn't provide sufficient stability. And what that's meant is that there's not space for me to put a scaphoid unit wire in. And that's why I've put an additional radiolunate wire in situ to try to uh, protect my soft tissue repairs more. So we've talked about management, what about the outcomes of these injuries? Well, the biggest trial is this multi-center trial from nearly 30 years ago now from the States. And it is this paper which provides the evidence that 25% of these injuries are missed at presentation. So this is 166 perilunates. This is the biggest series by a long way. Open injury had a worse outcome. And if treatment was delayed at six weeks, they also had a worse outcome. 56% of patients developed post-traumatic degenerative change. This paper is a much smaller paper, but is useful in a different way. 18 perilunates, a similar sort of 60% uh, degenerative change rate, but importantly, the degenerative change didn't seem to impact on function. But in this paper is a nice summary of the literature. And it's this paper that I use to provide me with my, the evidence that I tell my patients. And I tell my patients that they're gonna get three quarters of their range of motion and they're gonna get three quarters of their grip strength back. And as you can see from the series, the uh, flexion extension arc percent of contralateral is in between 70 to 80 and then similar with the grip strength. So this is the data that I use to support that. So in summary, perilunate injuries are uncommon, but a quarter of them are missed. They're a high energy injury. They tend to cause reduced grip strength and range of motion and commonly caused post-injury degenerative change. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, I'm happy to either take some questions or I can move on to cases. I'm going to hand back to you, Faraz. Yeah. Well, that's brilliant. Thank you very much, Mr. Riley. That uh, was very comprehensive and focused lecture. Um, we all learned a lot from you today. Um, I like the, the, how you described the extrinsic ligaments into two chevrons. Uh, I think that's a very nice concept to have and, um, in mind. And uh, I like how you presented your um, logic behind sort of systematic logical approach to how you would definitely definitively treat this um, with fixing scaphoid first, then if fractured or otherwise the mid carpal joint transfix them with wire and then do the soft tissue repair. And I think um, you presented this lecture in an exam oriented uh, manner and. Um, it's very easy and predictable here to try to read the examiner mind and what they're going to ask you next. So if we are all, if you all prepare all these steps 
as Mr. Riley has explained them, you are on to eight easily. And the examiner will be just sitting backwards and smiling and, and enjoying your, 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 your viva. And it's not impossible to do. I think uh, Mr. Riley has made this very easy and simple for us all. So thank you very much. Uh, I, think, I think there's a couple of things to my sort of pearls for the exam would be is that if you can convert the viva into almost a coffee room chat with your boss, then you're, you're doing well. And the way to, I think, to achieve that is to answer the question. And that means you have to listen to the question. So answer the question and give information in a succinct way so that the examiner is not trying to search through your, your prose for the answer. Um, and if you can deliver information in an algorithmic way, then that makes it easy for them. And I think if you, you know, in certain instances, you know the question is coming. You know, if you say, I'm going to get a CT scan and I'm going to refer it to the hand surgeon. Or if you've got, you know, an osteosarcoma, and you go, I think this is an osteosarcoma, so I'm going to refer this to my local sarcoma unit. You know the next question is going to be, so what's your sarcoma unit going to be? And they must sit there all morning dreading having to ask the question. So just take it away from them. Just say, well, the principles of um, treatment in the sarcoma center will be local staging, holistic staging. You know, I can't even, I don't even know anything about sarcomas anymore. But, you know, you're building in your algorithms and that's the same for complex infection and all of the other things. There's no point waiting for the question. Absolutely, that's what exactly what we try to emphasize in this teaching, that you need to understand why is the examiner asking this question and just get straight away to the answer. Um, and we try always to say, people, please, and that's when the Viva also, when you go on, get on to answering the question within 30 seconds, um, uh, straight away to scoring points within 30 seconds, um, no more. So um, I thank you very much, Mr. Riley, for this um, valuable explanation. I've just got a couple of questions for you before we move on to the MCQs. You have uh, Muhammad um, uh, asked a question uh, earlier. Is um, sorry, there was another question. Um, if if the if the if the dislocation, lunate dislocation, was reduced, closed. Does this patient still require further investigations and definitive um, repair later on, or can they just be treated non-operatively? So I don't think that there is a rationale for treating non-operatively. Um, there is no, there's no good evidence to say that opening these up, reconstructing every single ligament is necessarily better than treating them with just reducing it and putting percutaneous wires in. Does, there's no strong evidence to say that that gives you a better outcome. But if you reduce these and just put them into a plaster for, say, eight weeks, you are going to have ongoing calf instability. Okay, thank you. And another question from out of you is asking about the nice approach you said from um, Ramon. Uh, I'm just, I think, wondering why the approach was extended so much proximal. I'm sure there is a reason for this. Is there any? So the reason that I didn't call this a carpal tunnel decompression is that it's not a carpal tunnel syndrome. So this is a different phenomenon. So this is, in a way, this is a carpal, uh, a compartment syndrome of the median nerve. So what you want to be able to do is you want to have released and seen that median nerve way into the distal forearm fascia. So that's why you want to do a more extended approach. And um, a lot of candidates come through and they are, um, they're intimidated by that approach and they don't want to do it, which is why, well, they, they instinctively don't want to do it, which is why I say, if you do your carpal tunnel decompression first, you know where your nerve is, you can see it. You can then extend your incision. You can use your McDonald's to protect your nerve. You can then find your forearm fascia and you can release that under direct vision and you are happy that you've seen the nerve at all times. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, one more. Yeah. One other point to make is that yes, please. When, when you do the um, carpal tunnel decompression part of it, 
don't expect them to have a really thick transverse carpal ligament like patients do with carpal tunnel syndrome. These guys, because they're fit and healthy and don't have carpal tunnel syndrome, may have quite a thin transverse carpal ligament. So, you know, don't go gung ho. Okay. Be quite careful to start with. Uh, that, that's very very important point. Thank you very much for highlighting this. And I have to say, I like that principle. You said put um, pressure on the lunate while trying to do the manipulation. I think if you describe it this manner to the examiner, the, the exam, they will instantly know that you have been involved with these cases and you save surgeons. So um, it's very important. One more question we had also is if you take a patient to theater and you closely reduce um, uh, the dislocation, do you still have, as a non-hand surgeon, do you still have to uh, temporarily stabilize with K-wires? Or can you just put a plaster on it and refer on to the hands? So if, if, it, if the lunate's stable, put a plaster on and refer it. If, if the lunate or the carpus is very unstable, then just put the wires you need to hold it stable. So if you're, and in, in my experience, it is, it is not common that you find that it's all wobbly and it's all still unstable. Think about the amount of force required to get that to dislocate once you've got it back in. It's not a perfect anatomical position, but it's quite stable. So, um, say for instance, the lunate still wants to dislocate it out of the front, then just put a single radial lunate wire in. If you're finding that it was a three you've put back in and it's trying to rotate out, if you put a, a scaphal lunate and a lunate triquetral wire in, you can just hold it like that. So you, if it's stable, you do not need wires in. But if it's unstable, you know, you don't need to put that full baseball diamond um, configuration I showed in either. Just enough so that you keep it still. We had another couple of questions, but you answered them during your presentation. One from um, Melinda who was asked, is scaphoid fracture part of the injury? And, and you have described this and you described it. Um, so yes, it is part of the injury. So, the scaphoid fracture. The whole injury. So, um, scaphoid fracture is interesting because there is a common misconception that you can't get a scaphoid fracture and a scaphalunate ligament injury, and that's that's just wrong. Um, and in one of Mayfield's papers, um, so the the Mayfield Johnson relationship is interesting. So, in 1980, they they published three papers within two months. So there was a Johnson paper and a Mayfield paper in the June edition of the Clinical Orthopedics. But in the May, there'd been a combined paper that they both co-authored, also talking about perilunate injuries. And in one of those uh, original Mayfield papers, he describes a scaphoid fracture occurring and also a scaphoid ligament injury happening. So they definitely can coexist, which is something that's a common misconception. Okay, thanks for explaining that as well. And uh, uh, Kamal asked a question, um, if we refer the patient with median, uh, median nerve compression uh, at midnight, um, do you wait till next day? But I think you explained this is an sort of an emergency, isn't it? So expediently, you said that already. Yeah? Definitely. We take them theater any time they come in, isn't it? It's, it's, it's potentially limb-threatening, isn't it? Correct. So, so you don't wait these things. And, and, and for the exam purposes, well, in our practice and also for exam, most important thing is to be a safe surgeon. Um, so this is a limb-threatening injury. Thank you very much, so, uh, Mr. Riley, um, for answering all these uh, questions um, so beautifully. So uh, Ruth, if we can put on the um, uh, MCQ questions now, please, everyone. We're moving to the MCQs now. Um, we, Mr. Riley has prepared three questions. Um, it, um, please uh, ask, can I ask everyone to attempt to answer the, um, it's all fully anonymized. And uh, you have two minutes to answer them. Um, and here you are. So three questions, please attempt to answer all of you. Even us, so the mentors will, will be trying to do that. And Mr. Riley afterwards will take us through these questions and through the answers. 
um, and um, we'll see how well you will all be listening. Again, it's all anonym, anonym, anonymized, so please um, all attempt to answer. And uh, while you're doing that, I'll just uh, like to um, say after this, we will start. Um, we will stop the recording and start the Viva session. Um, in the Viva session, there will be Mr. Riley asking some questions. There'll be also my mentor colleagues here, um, Abdullah, Shwan, Nikki, Hani, uh, Sid, and Kashif. They're all men um, mentors. Um, they all been helping us um, setting up all this program. And they will be here also to ask you five questions and to give you feedback and mark you. So uh, um, we are thank all of them. Okay, just another 30 seconds to answer the questions, please. We are seeing some very interesting answers uh, so far, and thank you for uh, guys for taking part. Really high um, participation um, levels at the moment. I think most of the questions are clear cuts. One uh, one question is slightly a little bit more. Um, divided in between, so. Okay, I think most people have answered now, so I'm going to share the results. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so everyone can see the answers now. If Mr. Riley could kindly uh, take us through the questions and the answers. So the correct answer to uh, question one is a carpal instability complex. So carpal instability is an hour's presentation on its own. Um, but in order to achieve a complex carpal instability, you have to have both a dissociative and a non-dissociative instability. So I think that's potentially why people um, you know, opted for those answers. But two, three, and four Mayfields, Mayfield classifications two, three, and four, are all examples of a complex instability uh, carpal. Uh, we have 57% correct uh, answer on this one. Which ligament is the injured when the lunate dislocates? That's a short radial lunate ligament is the correct answer. So that is the really tough ligament which holds the um, lunate perched on the uh, edge of the radius it's it's you know both of these um questions then they're, they're not pass fail type questions if you if you don't know you know these small facts for this uh for this viva and clinical question you, you're not going to fail it's much they're much more interested in you demonstrating safety they want to know that you're going to decompress the median nerve they want to know that you're not going to miss it um so you know don't worry about that and then yeah 83 percent were listening at the end when and at the beginning when we talked about the fact that 25 percent of these injuries are missed at presentation nick did you have a couple of cases um that you want to discuss before we went on to the viva sessions yeah i'm happy to go through a couple of cases yes okay. please So have you got a single slide again? Yes. Good. So um, this is a, um, a mid 30 year old chap who was involved in a road traffic accident. Um, so you can see that um, he has uh, a perilunate injury. You can also see from these radiographs, it's difficult to make out where his scaphoid is and where his lunate is. Um, he also had a spinal injury, which uh, took precedence. So he had a sort of pseudo closed reduction and a median nerve decompression in the middle of the night. And then the spine surgeons got cracking with him. 
So we got a CT scan the next morning. And this kind of illustrates how badly the scaphoids can be um, displaced when they're trans-scaphoid injuries. So you can see from the, the coronal, uh, this, this scaphoid has been flipped quite, quite a long way. So the, um, the red line is his fracture line, the blue line is his mid-carpal joint, and the pinky orange line is his radiocarpal joint. So once we were in a position to offer him definitive surgery, um, I went in and I fixed his scaphoid, and I commonly do this with two screws when it's a trans scaphoid perilunate. Um, I put a long screw in and he was still unstable. And orientating these scaphoids when they've been displaced so far can be quite difficult, but we were happy with his um, fixation. Um, the wires, what I didn't mention was that the wires stay in for uh, eight weeks. Uh, to protect the soft tissues, they should stay in for eight weeks. And that's why I bury them. Some people leave them proud, um, but I bury them. There's, there's little evidence to say whether you should bury or not. But I feel that if I'm going to leave a K wire exposed for eight weeks, which is um, communicating with a joint, I feel that I should close the skin over the top of that. Um, but all you need to do is defend your position to the examiner. There's, there's no data that says one way is better than the other. And this guy, United, um, he's gone back, he's, he's achieved his three quarters range of motion. Um, and He's had uh, the screws removed because there was a little collapse in the scaphoid and one of them ended up a little bit too long. So we've taken his screws out and um, he's reasonably happy with his 75% range and strength. This is the complete other end of the spectrum. So this is the worst perilunate injury that I've had. And this was a gentleman driving a, um, a van who uh, was hit by another van overtaking another vehicle with a collision speed of you know, somewhere around um, combined around 100 miles an hour. So he had an open injury. Uh, the lunate was fractured and part of it is here. This is the proximal pole of his scaphoid. So in the middle of the night, he had it put back in and temporary wires used just to hold this carpus in a reasonable position. Um, the eagle-eyed amongst you will have noticed his positive ulnar variance. So he had a radial head fracture as well. So he had a um, combined uh, operation, um, firstly by um, me and one of our trauma surgeons who put a radial head in and I stabilized his carpus. And then he had a free flap and sural nerve grafts to his median nerve because as his lunate had dislocated, it had taken out half of his median nerve. So this is a horrendous injury to an arm. And the proximal carpal row was not reconstructable. So I had a long chat with him about what he would prefer. We prefer primary wrist fusion or would he prefer a proximal row carpectomy with a view to seeing how he did with his proximal row carpectomy and then we could fuse his wrist later. So that was his image, that's at about uh, nine months. You can see the plastic surgeon's ligger clips from their flap and you can see that at nine months, because he's been using it, he's already started to get degenerative. So I've subsequently provided him with a wrist fusion, which he's very happy with. Um, but this is the, the other end of the spectrum of a perilunate injury. It's unlikely they'll give you one as bad as this in the exam. It's very unlikely, and it'd be bordering on unfair. Um, but that's, um, that's the other end of the spectrum of these injuries. Lovely, Mr. Riley. Thank you very much.